Zachariah had no child that Elizabeth was barren, they still continued to serve God. And they served God faithfully. They were righteous as if they had no problem. But we also know that they were praying. They were prayerful because he is told that his prayers have been answered. It also teaches that children are a gift from God. And the children bring joy to parents and the community. So that is where we begin our journey according to St. Luke. So we are going now to start our walk. For, we are going to walk, but come this way. Please come this way so that I may explain something. <coughs> uh -huh. So the Gospel of Luke is um, it's where it begins is where it ends. You know, we have started in the temple. We will end in the temple. Because the last statement is that after Jesus went to heaven, his disciples, they went back to Jerusalem, where they continued to wait for the Holy Spirit. And the place where they were waiting, most likely they waited in the temple, because they were Jews. So it's like a circle. It begins in Jerusalem, it ends in Jerusalem. So now we leave Jerusalem, we will now go to the other annunciation. So we are now in Nazareth. So in Jerusalem, in the temple, we have talked about the annunciation of the birth of John the Baptist. Now in Nazareth, we talk about the annunciation of the birth of Jesus. And the announcement that uh, Jesus will be born was done by who? A John Gabriel. To who? Mary. To Mary. And Mary was a? I uh, remember when I came to your school, I talked about the favored girl. Yes. The, to the favored girl. And the greetings by the angel was to the favored girl. girl. Greetings you to you who is highly favored. The Lord is with you. The angel announced the birth of Jesus to Mary, who was a virgin. And Mary, did Mary believe? She also questioned. She also questioned how it can be possible for her to give birth when she is still other. So in both, for, for John the Baptist and for Jesus, we can say they both questioned. Um, but once he questioned, again, God gave a sign. And the sign was that a cousin, Elizabeth, who is buried, is six months pregnant. And with that, Mary believed as he said, I am only the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. So that is the annunciation. That's the annunciation of the birth of Jesus. So a question. Compare the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist and of Jesus. So what could be the similarities? Let's look for some similarities. Both were announced by an angel, Gabriel, uh -huh. another similarity. Both of them questioned. Both, 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 both the to be, both the to be born were boys, were sons. Uh -huh. Another similarity. In both names were given. Another similarity. Both of them were given a sign. For John, the father will be damp. For Mary, our cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Some differences? Yes? 
One difference? Uh -huh. Different gender. For John, it was done to, to the father, and here it was done to, to the mother. Mm -hmm. Another difference? Yes, behind there? Yes, for John, it is in Jerusalem. For Jesus, it is in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Another difference? Yes. Yes, for Jesus, the conception will be through the Holy Spirit. For John, it will be the Father. So that is announcement, annunciation of the birth. So if you go to Nazareth today, one of the features we see is a very huge church, which is called the Church of Annunciation. And they argue that is the place where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary. Then for Nazareth, the other thing that we run according to St. Luke in CRI, this is where Jesus grew. You know, there is a statement, Luke 2.52. Who has the Bible? Can you open Luke 2.52? Luke 2.52 summarizes the, the youth age of Jesus. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Yes, that happened, he happened here. So Jesus grew up in Nazareth. This is the place where Jesus was formed. This is where Jesus saw his father who was a, a carpenter or a foodie. So Jesus must have witnessed his father building and that's why Rita will be talking about the foolish and the wise builder. This is where Jesus saw his mother sweeping the house. Literally sweeping the house, looking for a rusty coin. And Rita will be giving a parable of the rusty coin. Because this is where he was brought up. Later when we get to the temple, we will see the time when Jesus got to us in the temple. When he was 12 years old. So, Three things that, that are important for Nazareth. One is the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Then the second one is that this is where Jesus grew up. The third thing is that in Nazareth, this is where Jesus started his ministry. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Let you open Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So that we can see what, how Jesus started his ministry. We can have that as a microphone. We can give to one of the... Yeah, pass the mic over here. For, to somebody with a Bible. So we are reading Luke chapter 4 verses. We start from 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was... His custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to test at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant then, and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, 
none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum. Okay, that's enough. So, according to Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 18, what did Jesus say his mission was? He said he came to do what? To proclaim the good news to the poor. What else? To? Uh, liberty to the captives. Recovery of sight to the bride. So that's a straightforward question. So that's a question that can be there. Explain why Jesus was rejected in Nazareth. Why was Jesus rejected in Nazareth? It is the answer is there in that text. Okay, he did not perform the same miracles he had performed in Capernaum. Uh -huh. Another point? Yeah, they knew him. That was the son of Joseph the carpenter. So he said that a prophet is never accepted in his own hometown or village. Uh -huh. And at that reason, why he was rejected? He claimed that the prophecy by Isaiah has been fulfilled. He knew him. Uh, another reason? He claimed to be Messiah. You know, he mentioned Gentiles very positively. When he talked about the widow of Sarafeth and Naaman, those who are Gentiles, and he said that the, 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 the prophets were sent to the Gentiles. But the Jews believed that when the Messiah came, he will come exclusively to the Jews. So now he, when he mentioned the Gentiles, those people could not listen to him. And they took him to the cliff. They wanted to kill him. But he left Nazareth. So we are now going to leave to Nazareth. Where did he go? It is mentioned there. He went to Capernaum. So he was rejected in his own hometown. And now he will leave. But before we get to Capernaum, we will pass through Bethlehem. So we are in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Who had prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Micah. So the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And there are several Old Testament prophecies that you need to remember. Because the birth of Jesus had been prophesied by prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 9. And then Isaiah 53, he talks about the suffering servant. Jeremiah also prophesies about the birth, the coming of Jesus. And Micah prophesies about the coming of Jesus. Nathan is also another prophet who mentions that Jesus, the Messiah will be born in the, in, the, in, the, in the household of David. So somebody can open Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. So as we wait for that, uh, we, let's say that uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And why, why had Joseph and Mary come to Bethlehem? They had come for the census. But when they came here, there was no space in the inn. So the only place where they could find shelter was 
So Jesus was born in a in a major. But being born in a major is not anything special. Because according to the Jewish culture and also our African culture, people could be born anywhere. People are born in Barabara. People are born in farms. People are also born in Mali Kama Apo, Major. Mali Kuna Wanyama. So somebody who is born in a major where there are cows, what could be the name? Yeah. But what makes this birth special, what makes the birth of Jesus in the major special, is what happened in the shepherd's field. The shepherd's field. But before we get to the shepherd's field, let's hear Micah chapter 5, verse 1 to 5. Now, master your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege are laid against us with a rod strike, the judge of Israel on, on the check. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are literal among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one, of, one who is to be a ruler in Israel, who coming forth is from of old, from an ancient from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is an, in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the Lord, in the name of the Lord his God, and he shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So, Joseph coming to Bethlehem, with the Mary when she was pregnant, see, they came so that the prophecy of Micah may be fulfilled. Yes. And when they came, the prophecy was fulfilled in that the mother gave birth to Jesus in Bethlehem. So it is important when you are revising, to know actually what prophet Micah prophesied, what Jeremiah prophesied, what Isaiah prophesied, what Nathan and Jeremiah and the psalmist prophesied, so that you don't mix up things. But uh, what they, all, the, all of them, what they prophesied, there is a lot of similarity, but there are a few, a few differences. So there are shepherds who are taking their care of their sheep in the field. Somebody behind there, you can lift up something written, Shepherd's Field. Can you lift that up? Uh -huh. In a way that they can see, the Shepherd's Field. So what happened in the Shepherd's Field? Uh -huh. An angel appeared to the Shepherd's. Yeah, did the angel see? Do not fear. It's important to remember that. <laughs> they just say, do not fear. <laughs> then what else? Who has been born in Bethlehem? Uh -huh. What else? Okay, you can see the reading. Uh, can you read, 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 read the, the event at the Shepherd's Field? And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for, her, for all the people. For you, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Mm -hmm. Continue. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth be peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and, and see this thing that has happened, 
which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph with the baby lying in a manger. Uh -huh. What did they do? And when they saw it, they they made known the saying that they they that had been told them concerning this child. And all who had it wondered at what the shepherd told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glory, fine and praising God for all they had seen and heard, as it had been told to them. As it has been, it, it had been told to them by the angels. So what can we learn as Christians from the encounter of the angel and the shepherds? What can we learn? Because it's application, you know, the story is obvious, but application is, is usually what gives people uh, challenges. We should? We should not be afraid of what? <laughs> First of all, how to recognize true messengers of God. As Christians, we should be able to recognize the true messengers of God. Because today, there are so many false messengers, false prophets, false preachers, false uh, <laughs> prophets of doom. So it is important to learn how to recognize. The angels were able to recognize that this is a messenger of God. Another thing. We should obey the message of God. We should obey. And we should obey without delay, immediately. The angels, the servants, obeyed. And when the multitude or the host of angels disappeared, right away they came straight away to confirm what they had been told. Another thing that we learn is that uh, good news brings joy, not pain. It brings joy, not pain. To share the good news. When they came, they shared what the angel and he told them with Mary. They shared. So good news should be shared. But I deliberately brought it in here so that the story can that we can have a bit of continuity. But we know that according to the syllabus, we, we have the the birth and the early ministry of Jesus or infancy of Jesus. Uh, some of the infancy of Jesus will be talking about it later. But let's now go to Capernaum. So, welcome to Capernaum. So, I want to, to, to share with you a few things about Capernaum. And it's important to know the spelling of Capernaum. It is C, not K. Capernaum. So when Jesus was rejected in death, he came to Capernaum. And Capernaum, they say it is the adopted home of Jesus. So this is where Jesus will be staying when he is carrying out his ministry in Galilee. So now we want to we'll be talking about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And there are a few things that uh, I want to say about uh, Capernaum. If you go to Capernaum today, uh, they have an image of the paralytic man. Because at Capernaum, Jesus healed a paralytic. There's a story of people who came, they brought somebody who was paralyzed, carrying him on a mat. But they could not take him to Jesus because of the crowd. What did they do? They climbed into the roof and removed a uh, part of the roof, all tiles. And they lowered the paralytic man down to where Jesus was. And Jesus commended them and he said, such great faith he has not seen. And he told the man, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees 
and the other religious leaders who were there, they started asking, who is this? It's only God who can forgive sins. This is blasphemy. But Jesus knew what they were saying. So he asked them, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? So he told them to show you that the Son of Man has got the power to forgive sins. He told that man, rise up and walk. And that man stood and he walked. So that is the healing of the paralytic in Capernaum. There is also another healing that happened in Capernaum of a man who had a paralyzed hand. He was healed on a Sabbath by Jesus. And the Pharisees were watching closely to see whether Jesus is going to heal him on a Sabbath. Jesus asked them whether it is, it is wrong to do good or harm on a Sabbath. And they could not answer. So Jesus told the man to stretch his hand and he was healed. And uh, the Pharisees, because of that, they started looking for a way <laughs> to deal with Jesus. So this is Capernaum. It is in Capernaum where Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother in Rome. She was suffering from what? Fever. From fever. And Jesus healed her and she started serving them. The other thing that happened in this town is the hearing of the centurion's servant. Now describe the hearing of the centurion's servant. Who can describe the hearing of the centurion's servant? Yes, give her the mic. Okay, use this. Jesus at Capernaum, and upon arrival, a man was sent by a centurion soldier to say to tell to Jesus that his servant was ill. On his way, the man sent another centu another servant to tell Jesus that he can just speak a word, and wherever the centurion servant will be healed, will be healed. <laughs> so let's give uh, let's say that question is out of ten. Let's give us some marks. How many how many marks shall we give? Five, we can give five. Yes. Yes, he has done well. So it is important to know that there was a centurion whose servant was here. So this centurion, he sent Jewish elders. That is important to know that he sent the elders, Jewish elders. And the Jewish elders told Jesus that if there is somebody he should help, it is this centurion. Because he built a synagogue for them. There is a synagogue in Capernaum which is preserved up to today and this synagogue was built by the centurion. The Jews elders said he built a, centuri, a, a synagogue for them and he also loved them. And Jesus agreed to go. But before he got to the centurion's house, the centurion sent another person, a servant. I don't know what uh, the good news say, what the uh, Arabs we say. But he sent a servant to come and tell Jesus, I am not worthy to have you come into my house. Just say, I want, and it shall be done. And then he went on to say, I am also a person under authority. And I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell another one, come, and he comes. So he says, just I want is enough. And Jesus commended his faith. He told the people who are there, such faith. I have never seen even in Israel. And when the servants who had been sent, when they went back, they found, they found that the, the servant had been healed. The best way to revise CRI is to form groups. Once you form a group of maybe three, four, or five, 
you can share you say you go and read about the healing of the centurion servant about you read about the healing of the of the paralyzed man or the man with the withered hand and then when you meet each person will narrate the story because you will not have the bible during the exam you know you run many times out to narrate the story from your hand because it will always be you, you tell the story describe state explain and then a bit of application so it is here again where jesus raised the jairus daughter jairus was a leader in the synagogue he was a leader in the synagogue and jairus went to jesus and he fell on his feet and he pleaded with jesus that my only daughter is dying come and lay your hand on her and she will be well as they were coming there was a widow no there was a woman who had been breeding for how long so what did she do uh, because she said what because she said in her heart if only he yeah, will be well. And when she touched Jesus' cloak, she felt it in her body that she had been cured. But Jesus stopped and asked, Who has touched me? Somebody responded to Jesus. Who, who responded? What did he say? Yeah, there are so many people who are pushing <laughs> and touching you. How can you ask who has touched me? But Jesus insisted. Somebody asked? touched me uh, because he felt the power flow from him and the woman when she realized that she cannot hide she came forward again she fell on, on her feet and she gave a story but it is also important to mention that this woman had spent all her resources with the doctors and it was becoming worse so these are two women this is a, we say this a, a story within a story. Because when Jesus was talking with this woman who had been healed, a messenger came from Jairus' home. Saying, do not trouble the master anymore. Your daughter has died. What did Jesus say? Yeah, only our faith. She, has, she is not dead. She is only. And they, when they came, they found that there were mourners in the house. Uh, Jesus told them she is only sleeping and they looked at him. How many people did Jesus allow into the house? Three disciples the, and the talent. Who are the three disciples? Yes. And when Jesus went to him, what, what did he do? Yeah, so he, he took her by hand, the little girl, arise, and she woke up. And she, he gave her back to the parent and he told them to give her something to, yes. to eat. I, I'm not sure. Little girl in Aramaic is Talidakum. I, I don't know whether there's Talidakum in RSV. No, it's just little girl. Yeah, little girl, arise, and die. You know, see, Aramaic is usually six questions. Uh, and uh, we are told whenever you, 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 the paper is put before you, it's important to scan all the questions. You look at all the questions so that you start with the best the question you think you are good at. So that the examiner can, when he or she marks the first question, we will know that this, uh, this is a student who knows what he is doing. Start with the easiest for you. So if you master what happened in Captain Aum, that's one question that you you have mastered so compare the healing of the two two women compare the healing of the two women jaira's daughter and the other woman okay let's let's try to look for some differences of course both of them are women uh -huh. The girl was how, how old? 
And that man has suffered for how many years? Twelve. The little girl and the sponsor. The old woman had nobody to talk on her behalf. She had to push. <laughs> yes. Even in Jira's house, there were people who were mourning the girl. But for this woman, she was an outcast. And that's why she is pushing from behind. Because if people saw her, they could have stoned her. But God is merciful to all. God is merciful to her. So, I think we, we can, um, that's enough for Capernaum. Now we are going to leave Capernaum. So, uh, once more I say, Jesus used to stay in Peter's house, so he could go and come back. So, one day, when Jesus was leaving Capernaum, he found a tax collector seated somewhere. And he told him, follow me. And that man left everything and followed Jesus. What is the name of that tax collector? Levi. Levi, also called Matthew. So what do you think he left behind? Money. 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 What else? Papers. Papers. Yes, records. He left behind records. And the money he left behind was government money and also his money. Because tax collectors were hated. Because they used to ask for more. They could ask for more so that they can have money to pay the government and also some money for them. So they were hated by the Jews. And later, Levi will invite Jesus for a meal in his house. And when Jesus is in the house, the Pharisees will start complaining, saying, this man is eating with tax collectors and sinners. So this is Levi. But he was not the first disciple to be called. So we will now continue our journey with Jesus. So now we are passing through a small village called Nine. Nine. Where is the other mic? Can you tell us what happened at nine? Describe the event at nine. Yeah, somebody pick the mic and tell us what happened at nine. Jesus was entering the city of Nain. He, he met with a crowd carrying a young man who was dead and he also and he also saw the mother of the young man and who was who was crying and Jesus felt pity for the woman and Jesus told her not to cry and he went and we told the young man to wake up. And when he woke up, he took, he took the young man to the mother. Yes, uh, don't be here my coffee. That's a my last. So it's just giving the story. And that is the story. It's important to know that he was the only son of this widow and Jesus and the pity on her so let's continue our mission so it's important to know that Jesus was very prayerful and often Jesus went to places to pray so Jesus went to pray and after praying he came down he came down and he chose 12 whom he called 
apostles. And here are the names of the apostles that Jesus chose from among the crowd that was following him. So we chose 12. And the 12 are You are reading here. <laughs> yeah, they, this is that's a problem. The one who wrote it made some mistakes. Because he wrote Bartholomew into bracket Revi, which is not true. Those are two different people. After he chose the twelve, he, he taught the salmon and the pain. Salmon and the pain is in, in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and it's important to emphasize the sermon of the pain because elsewhere in Matthew Matthew says a sermon of the mountain but for Luke it's sermon of the pain but there is, it's not a confusion because if you are here you can see the mountain there here the mountain is here here, up here, this is the mountain, and down here is the plain. So they are talking about the same thing. It's only one is seeing the mountain, the other one is seeing the plain. But for Luke, it is salmon on the plain. Uh, who has seen it? Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and live for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when false people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who fear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Mm -hmm. From one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you accept to, to receive, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So Jesus' requirement for the disciples, or standard, the standard that Jesus is setting for the disciples are very high, as we will be seeing later. The demands that Jesus is using on his followers is too high. If somebody strikes you on one cheek, what are you supposed to do? Yes. yes. <laughs> Don't report to the teacher. Give the other cheek as well. So now we are now entering into Lake Valley or Lake Gennesaret. That we uh, jump in, the lake has dried, so you need to drown. Just jump into the lake. So this is Lake Valley or Lake Gennesaret. Remember I said we are doing the ministry of Jesus in Galilee and 
this is the lake that gives this region the name Galilee. Yeah, go in. Can you go in? Because Jesus also spent time in the lake. So there are very important things to remember when we think about the lake. One is the call of the first disciples. The call of the first disciples. It took place here in the Galilee. And the call was accompanied by a miracle. So what is the miracle that happened? The miraculous catch of fish. Uh -huh. So who can, who can explain the miraculous catch of fish? Yeah, just tell us the story. What happened in the miraculous catch of fish? Yes? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, give her. She wants to say something. Yes. This is CRI and CRI. You know why I say CRI is a simple subject? Because every Sunday we are reading the Bible. And every time you go to church and you listen to the preacher, I do make it part of CRI and take notes because it's either reading the Bible or applying the Bible. So here now we are just explaining what the Bible says. Uh, the miraculous catch, yes. Jesus was preaching to a crowd and then in, in, <coughs> while sitting on the boat of Simon Peter and he told Simon Peter to push the boat into the lake so that they could go and catch, and catch. <laughs> catch the fish. And, and Simon Peter said that they had stayed the whole night in the but they had not caught any fish. And Jesus told them, just go. And when they to cast when they were in the lake they he told them to cast in the net and they caught the fish. <laughs> and they had a great catch. And they caught so many fish that they had to ask for help. So what did Peter do after that? How did Peter react? No, tell us, don't you tell your neighbor. Tell us. After the catch, Simon Peter went to Jesus and told him to go away from him because they were the same Mm-hmm. Then Jesus said what? So, who else was there? James? <laughs> <laughs> Peter and? And Andrew. So that is the first. Uh, that's the 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 the, the, core, the That is the core of the first disciples of Jesus as a result of the great catch. Then the other thing that happened in this lake. There is another miracle that you must remember that also happened in this lake. Coming of the storm. Coming of the storm. Jesus told his disciples, let us cross to the other side of the sea. And they got into a boat. But then what happened? Uh, turn the microphone, Pandey. Somebody is, is telling us what happened. Strong wind 
bit of making the boat to to move to move. And then the disciples started getting afraid. Jesus was asleep at the moment, so they they awakened uh, Jesus. Jesus questioned their faith, and then came the storm. Uh -huh. And then what happened when he came to the storm? Jesus came to the storm and there was a great calm. And the disciples were greatly afraid. They started asking, Who is this? That even the wind and the sea obeys him. So at that juncture, it seems the disciples have also not really understood who, the, who Jesus is. And that's why they're asking, Who is this? But that, that miracle also showed that God has power over nature. God has power over nature. And nature obeys its master. So they crossed over to the other side. As they came over, they met a demoniac. They met a demoniac who asked Jesus, What do you have with us? Have you come to destroy us? Jesus asked him his name. And he said, Yes, in his region, because, because they were many. And Jesus cast out the demons, and the man was okay. But the people of this region, then they told Jesus to go away because they were equally afraid. They did not know him. Then, there, then by that time, by this time now, there are so many people who are coming to Jesus because of the miracles that he is doing. He, they are bringing all kinds of people. And at Bethesda, there was a huge crowd that came to listen to Jesus. They brought their sick to be healed. And during the day, the disciples went and told Jesus to send the crowd away to the neighboring villages so that they may get something to eat. But Jesus told them to give them food themselves. So where did the food come from? There was a young boy with what? Two fish and five loaves of bread. That is what the Bible says, but uh, if, if you are a mother, can you give your, your, your little boy five loaves of bread for, for lunch? So it's, that's what the Bible says, but uh, when we read it, we always say it's actually not five loaves. It could be maybe species of bread, or pan cake, or biscuits. And the two fish are not two trapia fish. There are two, two maybe fragments, pieces of fish, two. So what did Jesus do with the boy's lunch? He took it, gave thanks. Then, then he broke it and gave it to the disciples and told them to distribute. How many people ate? Five thousand. Yes, it's important to say they are men. It's five thousand men. Because women and the children were not they were not counted. We answer that question in a short while. How many baskets remained? Twelve. Where do you think they went? Each disciple. What about the one of the ranch? The boy went away empty handed. <laughs> so 
So by this time, Jesus has become very popular. And by this time, people want to make Jesus their king by force. So Jesus left them and they went into a solitary place. And when Jesus went into a place where he went to pray. And when the disciples came to him, he asked them, Who do the people say I am? So who answered that question? What did he say? A prophet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We are in chapter 9. Now we are in chapter 9 of Luke. Yeah, it's important to say some say we are John the Baptist who has come back to life. Others say we are. No, you are Elijah. It's important to mention Elijah. Some say we are Elijah because according to the old prophet, to the prophecy, people expect, expected Elijah to come before Jesus. So some are thinking it is Elijah who has come. While well, others say one of the old prophets has come back to life. So that was a, that was in reference to who those people say I am. Then Jesus asked them, Who do you say I am? Who answered that question? Yeah. What did he say? He said the Christ of God. He told Jesus you are the Christ of God. Christ and Messiah means the same thing. It means anointed. You are the Messiah or the Christ of God. And that was true. And that becomes now the turning point of Jesus' ministry. Because immediately after that, chapter 9 verse 51, who can read it? Chapter 9 verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Yes, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now from here, Jesus will set his face to go to Jerusalem, and what we have is now the travel narrative. Now we will be taking the journey now to Jerusalem. But then Jesus also told them for the first time that he will die. So now that they know Jesus, now Jesus tells them that the Son of Man will be rejected. He will be killed. But he will rise again on the third day. But they do not understand. So now we are starting our journey to Jerusalem. But we also mean this journey with a bit of uh, Galilean ministry and other things. Yeah. Can you just stand up with you? Yes. Uh -huh. Go up here. There. Yeah. There. No, one of you go up, up there. <laughs> so, another one. Uh -huh, another one. So, it says, eight days later. Eight days later, Jesus went up on a mountain. That mountain is the mountain of transfiguration. So, and we also went with some disciples. How many disciples? Three. So the three of you just go near. Don't go very near. Just go near. Yeah. Now, so what happened to Jesus when he was up there? His appearance changed. How is it described? Dazzling white. Uh -huh. Then what, what else happened there? Two men, Two men appeared to him. Moses and Elijah. What are they doing with Jesus? They talked about what? They talked about his death in Jerusalem. Yes. They talked about the things he is going to suffer in Jerusalem. 
What about the disciples? These disciples who are nearer. They were sleeping. Then what happened? When they woke up, they saw. Uh-huh. They saw that they, they saw the new appearance, the glory. And away, away, a crowd covered them. Then what happened? Uh-huh. Peter wanted to build. Three tents. One for. Another for. And the other for. Uh -huh. Then what else happened? A voice. A voice came from heaven. What did the voice say? Listen to him. So it is important to know. This is my beloved. Listen to him. And who has been told that? Who is that was for the disciples? It's the disciples who are being told that. Then after that, they found that Jesus was by himself. And they came down. Now, together with the disciples, I have to meet at Okia Pande here, just slowly. So as they were coming down, they were met by what? No. As they came down, there was a crowd. A crowd. Then a man came to Jesus and fell at his feet. And he pleaded with Jesus because his son was demon possessed. You can see the story. Have you found it? Let's listen to, it, to the story. How does it unfold? Yes, pass the micro, microphone, microphone here. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is the only child. And behold, a spirit seized him, and he suddenly cried out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this thing, and it was concealed from them, so they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this thing. So Jesus tells them for the second time that the Son of Man will die. The first time is there, now here for the second time. After that, what did he say? Just the, 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 the rounds after that. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side, and said to them, Whoever receives this, this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent him, who sent me. For he is who is less among you. You all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he, he does not follow with us. Okay, that's enough. So, you see that immediately after hearing that Jesus is going to suffer, he's going to die, they started arguing. Which of them is the greatest? Or which of them is going to take over? Because the leader is dying. But the reason is that they do not understand. So now we are on our journey now to Jerusalem. 
so there will be no walking so it is important to mention a few things about uh, being a disciple so because Jesus is going to Jerusalem and is going to die he must prepare his followers so one thing that he tells them is that if anyone will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me then that means it's time for a decision then there will be another person who will tell Jesus I will follow you wherever you go and Jesus told him foxes have holes and the birds of the hair have nests but the son of man has no way to lay his head Then Jesus told another man, follow me. And the man said, I will follow you, but allow me to go and bury my father and my, father, my mother. But Jesus told him, leave the dead to bury the own dead. When we were on the side, we talked about the disciples of Jesus, they were all men. And again at the side, we saw that only men were counted. But there are also women followers of Jesus. There are women who followed Jesus very, very faithfully. And some of these women include Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been cast out. There was Johanna, who was the wife of Susa. There was Susanna. And others. So the question we can ask ourselves when we are here is, why are some leaders against women leadership in the church? Why do you think some people are against women leadership in the church? Women gossip. Well, women brought sin to the world. Okay, yeah, and that is according to the according to Genesis chapter three. It is the woman who allowed sin or permitted sin into the world. That's an argument that has been used. Another reason. Okay, Jesus did not have a woman disciple. Jesus chose only men. So why should women lead? Another reason why women are not allowed to lead and there are places where they are not even allowed to preach in church. Yes, according to the Jewish culture and also our African culture, women were considered to be lesser beings. And that's why they are not counted in Bethesda. Because when the Bible talks about the people, it, uh, it is about the men. Any other reason that you can think about? According to the... Yes? Yes, that's another argument. Women should listen to men. Men are the hand. <laughs> and actually Paul, Paul says in, in Corinthians that women should not speak in the church. But then there are other biological reasons as to why women, some people oppose women leadership in the church, like uh, the Bible in Leviticus say during the monthly period they are impure. So women will, ha will have interruptions. If they are in leadership, there will be interruptions. For example, when they are pregnant. Or when they are taking care of a baby. They will not be available. Also some people will argue that uh, women cannot do some heavy jobs, serious jobs, like construction, like uh, lifting heavy things, digging a toilet. So women are considered to be weaker 
than men. And because of such arguments, then women should take a back seat even in leadership. So to Adere. There was another man who wanted to follow Jesus, but he told Jesus, allow me to go and say bye-bye to my parents. And Jesus told him, no one who put his hand to the prow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So now, compare me what we, we saw in the Sermon on the Plain and what we have run, run, uh, read about uh, discipleship here. What are the qualities of a uh, good disciple of Christian, of, of Christ? A good disciple of Christ. Yes. Yeah, should be able to live. Should be able to live. Live. And when you say living, it includes living your parents, living your friends. Sometimes you will be, be required to live your husband if you are married or your wife or even your children for the sake of Christ. Then a disciple needs to make the decision to follow immediately. You don't wait tomorrow. And once you have made your decide, decision to live, to follow Christ, follow Christ without looking back, backsliding, is not permitted. And then following what we did, we learned from the sermon on the plane, a disciple should be ready to suffer. That's why he said, Ukipiwa uh, pandei, ata yungine, upeame. If they take your cloak, surrender even the tunic. Yes. Following Jesus is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. But also following Jesus means not judging other people. Yeah, so that you may not be judged. So there are several things about being a good disciple. However, let me mention something here. Parable of the sower. Jesus gave the parable of the sower. It is important to notice that in the parable of the sower, there is a man who is the sower. He went to sow. And he sowed through a method called broadcasting. Broadcasting is drawing. He is sowing his seeds. And because it is broadcasting, the seed fell in different soil. How many are there? Some seed fell along the path where they were trodden upon and others were eaten by the birds of the air. Uh, then some seeds fell where? Among the voice. Then others fell on? On the rocky ground. Then some fell on the fertile soil. So there are four types of soil. Four types of soil. And it is important to write them in the lyrics, write them. You start with the path, it goes to the rocky, then, then fatal. Fatal is the last one. So what happened to the seed that fell along the path? They were, uh, some were eaten by the birds of the air, the rest were trodden upon, so the sewer did not get anything. Then those which fell among the rocks, they germinated. But they withered very quickly because there was no moisture. Then the ones which fell among the vines, they also germinated and they grew very fast. They were choked. Then those which fell on the fertile soil, they germinated and produced a hundred fold. Yes, they produce a hundred fold. So it is important to know which kind of soil you are. Yeah, what type of soil are you? You are the fertile soil. Okay, you know that the path, the, the things which fall along the path represent those students who are here, but they keep nothing in the mind. Yeah, it's like my teacher used to say, in Angria, Apa, in Matokea, Apa, Yote, Akuna Kitu, Inabaki. 
say the teacher will end up with 11. The teacher has been in the class for 30 minutes, but we can use some of the Nikama to Marimu Akua. Then the seed which fell among the, ro the, the, the rocks represent those who are here. They receive it, but it, it disappears also very soon. They are excited. They are excited to hear, but they keep nothing in the mind. And those which are, which are choked by the walls represent those who are here, but the pressures of this world, the riches and the pressures of this world. <laughs> We will not permit them to continue. They backslide soon. But those who give a hand to the food are those who hear the word of God. They keep it in their heart and they are transformed. So decide which type of soul you are. So as Jesus continued with his ministry, he observed in a party how people are choosing the front seat. People were competing for the front seat. So he told them, if you are invited for a party, don't sit at the right table. Sit at the wrong place so that you can have the honor of the host coming and telling you to go and sit in the upper place. But if you sit at the, at the, at the high table, then you will have shame if you are told to give that space to somebody else. Then Jesus went ahead and told them not to worry. Do not worry about food. Do not worry about clothes. Do not worry about the food you eat. What you eat. Look at the bands of the air. They neither plant or have a store. But whenever God provides to them, he then told them to look at the flowers. And he says, even Solomon, despite his spreader, he was not as beautiful as the flower in the field. So if God is able to take care of grass, which is there today and tomorrow it with us, how much more is going to take care of you? So seek you first the kingdom of God, and all the others will be added to you. So what we have done, we have gone around Galilee. That is the region of Galilee. And now Jesus is leaving Galilee for the last time. And now we are going to enter into a region called Samaria, where Samaritans lived. But just before Jesus left at the border, he turned around and looked at what he had done. And he said the new statement, the new, new W O E. Woe unto you, the Resider and the Corazine. If the miracles which were done in your place were done in Tyre and Sidon, the people of Tyre and Sidon could have repented. On the, on the, on the day of judgment, there will be no mercy for them. And then he said, Woe unto you, Capernaum. If the miracles which were done in your place were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, the people of Sodom could have repented. On the day of judgment, there will be more mercy for Sodom and Gomorrah than you. Then he turned around and entered Samaria. And when he entered Samaria, the first encounter, the first encounter in Samaria were the ten lepers. The ten lepers. And I have deliberately put them away from the road because lepers were always kept away from the population because they could pass leprosy to the other people. So the ten, they shouted to Jesus, have mercy on us. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priests. And as they were going, they realized that they were cured. What happened after that? One went back to Jesus to say, Thank you. Uh, how did Jesus react?
Yes. Jesus has wa wa you made to ten. Wa there wa there made to ten of you. Why is it only one? one. This Samaritan, the one who came back was a Samaritan. Why is it only one who has come to say thank you? He told him, Go, your faith has healed you. So, God is happy when you give thanks. Can we mention some of the things for which you can give thanks? Life, good health, families. Yeah. So there are so many reasons as to why you should give thanks to God. And God is happy when we go back to say thank you. Well, remember we are in Samaria. And Jesus sent some people to go ahead of him to prepare the places he is going to pass through. But there is a Samaritan village that refused to welcome Jesus. A Samaritan village that refused to welcome Jesus. Why? Why did the Samaritan village refuse to welcome Jesus? Because he was a Jew and he was going to Jerusalem. And the Jews and the Samaritans <laughs> yeah, they were not in good terms. They looked at each other as enemies. We are not in the but they were not friends. So tribalism. Tribalism. What does the church teach about tribalism? It is bad. <laughs> The Bible says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. So in the eyes of God, we are equal. So tribalism is evil if it is used to oppress other people or to favor up people against others. According to the Bible, we are all bodies, we are parts of the same body. Whose head is Jesus? So we should be ready to welcome other tribes, people of other color, people of different gender. We should be ready to welcome all of them. We should not discriminate people based on race, gender, or sex. In the eyes of God, we are the same. So when, when this village refused to welcome Jesus, two of Jesus' disciples asked him, should we call fire from heaven? <laughs> and consume them. Who are the two disciples? Peter. Not Peter this time. No. It is John and James. Elsewhere, they are called sons of Vanda. John and James are sons of Sebedee. So, what did Jesus do when he was refused entry by this, this village? Jesus went another way. So we don't go that way. We have been refused. We use the bypass. So this is the journey to Jerusalem. We are going to Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 12. No, 15. We are around 15. 12, 15. Chapter 12. What is 2, 15? Verse 15. Now we are in an area where Jesus realized that the time is catching up. Because it's, uh, it was when he was going to Jerusalem when Herod went to see him. And he was told to, some people go to him and tell him to get away because Herod wants to kill him. Go and tell that fox. I have only today and tomorrow. So, time is catching up and there is a lot of things that Jesus wants to share with his followers. So, around here, when Jesus is still on the road, this is where he is going to give the, the, the parable of the rich fool. The parable of the rich fool. 
Uh, somebody can tell us that parable from the, your hand. Describe the parable of the rich fool. No, from your hand. <laughs> Remember, he said the rule could give stories. The parable of the rich fool. Okay, you give us the parable of the rich fool. So you give us the parable of the of Lazarus and the rich man. And somebody else will give us the parable of the the wicked steward, the unfaithful steward. Okay, the parable of the rich fool. The rich man had the time for harvesting had arrived. So he decided, he said that the other bands were old and could not store all the harvest that he would harvest. So he decided that he would destroy the old bands and build new bands to store the food so that he will not be working. Um, all he'll be doing is eating, sleeping. And then God told the rich man that you fool, your soul is needed to not mm -hmm. <laughs> So they asked him a question, to who are you going to leave all this? The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus went to the rich man's house to ask for food, but the rich man refused to give him food. And then he went and ate with the dog. When Lazarus was. Okay, listen to the story first. Yes, continue. No, you are on the right track. Lazarus ate the the food of the dog, and then the the rich man and Lazarus died. All all of them, an angel appeared to Lazarus and took his soul to where he was taken to heaven, and then the rich man was taken to hell. When he saw Lazarus, he told him that to drop little of water, a drop of water, so that he can be that he can be not be that. Mm -hmm. What was he told by Abraham? Okay, give her to help you finish the story. Things where Lazarus was outside their suffering. Uh -huh. So, and then the rich man told, told Abraham to tell Lazarus to talk to his brother and tell him not, not to follow Adri and to repent, but Abraham told him. That prophet has been sent to them, and they did not hear. Yeah, so that even if somebody goes back from life, from death, they will not listen. Now the parable of the unfaithful steward. The parable of the master and the steward. So the master left the steward and went to another country. But he had a boat that the steward was missing his property. So when he came back, he asked the steward where, why people are saying that he's missing his property. That's when the steward was giving out debt, but not he was giving out debt, but not he was not asking for them. So when he went to the people who he was giving debts and told them that he had forgiven them, since the master had told him that he would suspend him, hence. If suppose the master suspends him, he will be he the people will 
welcome him since they had forgiven them his debts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are parables about uh, wealth. So, what does the Bible teach us about wealth? <coughs> wealth. First of all, ensure that you understand that you can, exp you can write, you can describe those parables. But then the question is, those parables are ab talking about wealth. So, what does the Bible teach us about wealth? Riches. All riches. Mm -hmm. So, true riches are stored in heaven. So, the, the, the teachers have, what, our, our wealth here is temporary. It's temporary. True wealth is in heaven. Uh -huh. Another thing that the teachers about wealth, is wealth good? Yes. Wealth is good. The Bible teaches us that we should work for our wealth. It is good, but it should be shared. Where well, it should be shared. Then the Bible teaches us that we are only stewards. We are only stewards of God's wealth. From the parable of the rich fool, wealth should not be accumulated for pressure. We should not accumulate wealth for pleasure so that we can sleep and enjoy. From the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, wealth should take care of the needy. We should take care of the needy, the poor in our community or our poor members. It's not good for somebody to be having so much and the other person has nothing to eat. We shall give an account. We shall give an account of how we used what God gave us. Then it's around this place where parents brought children to Jesus so that he may bless them. But the disciples rebuked them, stopped them. But Jesus said, Let little children come to me. To me. And you know also Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven with the children. So how does your church take care of children? And what is the role of children today in the church? So the role of children is singing, dancing, children, cleaning the environment, that is child labor. Yes, that would be child labor. Yes. Yes, that's child labor. Collecting letters, that is still child labor. <laughs> Children can pray. They pray. Yes. They can also read the word of God. Yes. They can do memory verse. Yes. They can do presentations. Yes. Collect yeah, they can also collect offerings. But uh, ensure that we are, uh, ensure that it's not work. <laughs> it is around this place where Jesus talked about family life. According to the Old Testament, according to the rule of Moses, divorce was permitted. But for Jesus, he said, if you divorce your wife and marry another one, you are committing adultery. And for Jesus, marriage is permanent. There is no divorce. And it is one man, one woman. Yes. Do you allow divorce today? It's common. Yes. It's rampant. Yeah. Okay. So, what happens? What what would what happens for children who in divorced families? 
So they can suffer from trauma, emotional stress, they can drop out of school, they can go to drugs, they, they can commit suicide because of uh, trauma, they suffer from mental illness, uh -huh. they have no parental love, yes. <laughs> Peer pressure. Uh -huh. Yes, they do, especially when other, when other girls and boys are talking about their parents. Yeah. <laughs> and they themselves, they can't talk about their parents, you know. <laughs> they may engage in, in prostitution. They can find themselves seeking for jobs when they are still children, seeking employment. They can be married by old men, old, old, old women, all those things. Yes. Those who are children from divorced families. Yes, they may. You know, they are, they are prone. They are vulnerable. So, someone here that Jesus talked about the various things. Chapter 15. They are lost things. They are living things which were lost. They are lost coins, they are lost sheep, and they are lost the prodigal son. The prodigal son. They are lost and found. They are lost and found. Remember when we were talking about the mission of Jesus? Jesus will continuously be saying that I came to seek and save the lost. So this is a way where we say Jesus gave a lot of teaching on Christian ethics, on morals, on behaviors. So why does the church co condemn homosexuality? It's a biblical. Another reason? Uh -huh. Can we lead to spread of diseases? Mm -hmm. Rejection? Separation mm -hmm. yeah, it, is, it is not natural. It is not natural. It cannot lead to procreation. Yeah. Yeah. It also may reduce the number of people who are seeking for marriage. Yeah. So marriage, marriages are under threat. What does, the, what does the Christianity and uh, African traditional religion have in common about marriage? Uh -huh. It is ordained by God. Between men and women. It is permanent. It is sacred. No, no, no. Man is the end of the house in birth. Mm -hmm. It is complete with or without children, uh -huh, but that requires some qualification. Because in ATR, if there are no children, it is it is yeah. yeah, the husband can get another wife and get children. Yeah, get children from another wife, or even could be divorced. Yeah. Can be returned back to your home. Yeah, yeah. in both status change. Yes. In both status of the individuals will get married change. Yeah. Once you are married, you can also you can now assume leadership role. In birth, children should be brought up in a responsible manner. In birth, conjugal rights should be fulfilled. Yes. So, and many other things. So let's, let's continue. We, we, uh, now, remember, I said that Jesus was very powerful. Uh, 
they should have come earlier, but I'll do it here because I want to uh, to talk about Luke chapter 18. Jesus was very prayerful, and one time when he was praying, his disciples went to him and he said, Teach us to pray. pray. And he taught them to pray according to the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Then he gave several parables related with the prayer. Several parables which are related with the prayer. So somebody to give us one parable related to prayer. The parable of yeah, the woman and the judge. What happened to the woman? She kept on going to the unjust judge. It's important to say that the judge never cared for man, nor feared God. But because this woman kept on going, he said this woman will wear me down. So he delivered justice for her so that she can stop going. Another parable? Can you tell me the prayer? Tax collector and? Uh -huh, what happened? So how do we, the Pharisee pray? He was bragging about what? How much he gives to the church, how he tithe? Uh -huh. How do, what else does he do? Fasting. He used to fast? And when he said he's not like the tax collector. Yes. And when the tax collector prayed, how did he do it? Uh -huh. So who's prayer were answered? Yeah. Another parable related to prayer. The flood at night. Uh -huh. And then Jesus asked, if your son asks you for for bread, will you give him a stone? What about if he asks for a fish? So if you know how to give good things to your children, what about your heavenly father? So those parables, what do they teach us about praying, about prayer? We should pray persistently. Yeah, we should uh, approach God with humility. Yeah, we should have faith. Close the door. <laughs> no, suppose you are playing in a farm like here. Where there is no door. Prayer is communication with God. Yeah. And even in prayer, we should respect other people. Mm. And prayer is not about bragging. Prayer is praying to God that God may be, may be merciful to you. What about praying around, shouting? You pray to God, you don't pray to people. Yes. But is, that does not mean you cannot pray loud. People come here to pray, and you can hear somebody shouting from that corner, another one shouting from the other corner, but they are directing their prayers to God, not to people. So, however you pray, know that you are talking with your maker. Yeah. Now, now we face now this direction. Now we are in the wilderness. Who was preaching in the wilderness? Jordan. John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness. Now, River Jordan, the source of River Jordan is where we were, where we said Jesus was asking his disciples, who do people say I am? 
the river Jordan, that time it is, that place is very small. You can even, you can stretch your hand and it's a very narrow river. Then it comes into Rigivarini. Then it flows out of Rigivarini down into the wilderness. By the time it gets to the wilderness, it is wide. And flowing very slowly, near Darin and near Darin. So it is here in the wilderness where John was preaching and baptizing. So compare the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus. It's important to let John the Baptist preach in the desert, in the wilderness. Mostly Jesus preached in villages, in the synagogue, and in towns and around the world. But John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness. It is important to know that John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. He came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And even who alone is baptizing, we will remind the people that somebody else is coming after me. Greater than me, and not even worthy to untie in his shadows. So, and the minister of John was preaching the, the, the message of repentance. And this repentance was to be practical. If you have two shots, give one to the one who does not have. The soldiers, he told them never to accuse anybody of falsely. Tax collectors do not ask for more than we are supposed to. So it was very, very practical. But then he was baptizing and uh, he, he was, Jesus also came to be baptized. So you can come in, come. Yeah, can just come, stand there. So you want to be John the Baptist or Jesus? Yes, <laughs> okay, come, come over. The next girl. Yeah, yeah, come over. <laughs> you are John the Baptizer. <laughs> so finally, John baptized Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, what happened? Adam. 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 What came from heaven? No, it is the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came from heaven. What else happened? A voice was heard from heaven saying, With whom I am pleased with. So at that juncture, the Bible says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, where did he go? Yeah, he went into the wilderness. He did not go preaching, he went into the wilderness. Now, it is important to know that what is happening here is happening as a fulfillment to the Old Testament prophets. So now we are going to go to the wilderness. Now Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. But what happened to John? <laughs> he was in prison for, because of who, who did he rebuke? He rebuke his somebody. Yes. Herod. What had Herod done? Yeah, his brother's wife. His brother's wife. Why is he that wrong? <laughs> so, what does the church teach about adultery? It is? It is ungodly, it's a sin. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh -huh. It can lead to break down of families. Yes. Yeah, it can lead to break down of families because most likely some people say that Herod had killed his brother so that he can marry his wife. Yeah. 
What else? What does African traditional religion teach about uh, sexual morality? It can lead to somebody can be cast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Usually, our forefathers punished people who committed sexual immorality. It was punishable, including sometimes by, by death. <coughs> According to African traditional religion, children were not permitted to enter the bedroom of their parents. And according to African traditional religion, people are not expected or allowed to display their sexual errors. And sexual intimacy was a private business. It was not done in public. And like today, there, there, is, a, there is one nation in the one country in the world that has declared that sex is, is a game like any other game. Yes. Yes, and the people can even go and speculate and spectate. Just like you can go to see football, you can now go and see. So that is the problem of permissiveness. Well, let's continue. Now we are going to the real balance with Jesus. say something about uh, a place called the city of Judah. Remember that Zachariah, Zachariah's wife is pregnant and Mary was told you are cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. After the age of Mary, Mary undertook a journey to go and visit Elizabeth. Now the two women, one is six months pregnant the other one is just a few days pregnant. They meet and greet each other. And when they greeted each other, the baby that was in Elizabeth's womb leaped with joy. And Elizabeth told Mary, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your labor. And then Mary sang the song of Mary. Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. My heart rejoices in the Lord my Savior. That song was sung here. In Jerusalem, there was another song which was sung by Zachariah. Which song? Benedictus. So these are two important songs. Magnificat, song of Mary. Benedictus, song of Zachariah. Now, compare and contrast the two songs. Okay, one was sung by a man, the other one was sung by a woman. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. One was sung, the Benedictus was sung after the bath. Magnificent before the bath. Mm -hmm. Another. In both the songs, they glorify God. Both the songs, they glorify God. Mm 